Thank you, Mr. President. I ask to be recognized for 10 minutes. Senator from South Carolina. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President, I want to raise uh, an issue before the body. I don't know how accurate the press reports are, but apparently the Chief of Staff of President Obama, Mr. McDonough, today spoke in town to a uh, group called J Street, which is uh, an organization supportive of a U.S.-Israel relationship, apparently. And here's what he allegedly said. He basically said that an occupation that has lasted more than 50 years must end. So the Chief of Staff of the President of the United States, speaking in Washington today, called the Israeli presence in the West Bank an occupation. The Chief of Staff of the President of the United States is looking at a world completely different than the one I'm viewing. To Mr. McDonough and President Obama, don't you realize that the last time Israel withdrew in the Mideast, Palestinian-controlled territory, was the withdrawal from Gaza? And that when Israel voluntarily left Gaza, Hamas took over Gaza, they're a terrorist organization, and they fired up to 10,000 rockets from Gaza into Israel. Today, Israel has a presence in the West Bank. Today, Israel is surrounded by radical Islamists unlike any time that I can remember. The language used by the Chief of Staff of the President of the United States is exactly what Hamas uses. So now our administration is taking up the language of a terrorist organization to describe our friends in Israel. And here, here's a question to the American people. Would you withdraw from the West Bank, given the situation that exists today on the ground between the Israelis and the rest of the region? Would you, at this moment in Israel's history, completely withdraw from the West Bank, given the experience in Gaza? Does anybody on the left think that's a good idea? Does anybody in Israeli politics agree with the characterization of the Chief of Staff of President Obama? Does Mr. Herzog or anyone else in, a, in opposition to Prime Minister Netanyahu agree with this characterization? Is your country occupying the West Bank? Or are you there to make sure that the West Bank doesn't turn into Gaza? I talked with the Prime Minister Saturday and I congratulated him on a decisive victory, and I look forward to working with him. And he told me very clearly that he believes a two-state solution is not possible as long as the Palestinian Authority embraces Hamas, which controls the Gaza Strip, and a terrorist organization by any reasonable definition. Who do you make peace with, Mr. President? What kind of deal can you make when half the Palestinian people almost, are in the hands of a terrorist organization who vow to destroy you every day. What kind of deal is that? So do I want a two-state solution? Yes, I'd like a two-state two solution where the Palestinians recognize the right of Israel to exist and they have the ability to chart their own destiny. They're not anywhere near there. The Palestinian community is broken in two parts. The Hamas terrorist organization controls a substantial part of the Palestinian community. They won't recognize Israel's right to exist. They're using the, ten the territory they hold as a launching pad for attacks against Israel routinely. These are the people that launch rockets from schoolyards and apartment buildings trying to blame Israel for being the bad guy when they respond. All I can say is that when I thought it couldn't get worse, it has. When I thought we couldn't reach a new low in terms of this White House's view of the Mideast, we found a way to reach a new low. Today, the Chief of Staff of the President of the United States used language that's been reserved for terrorist organizations up until now. So Mr. McDonough, President Obama, you're completely delusional about the world as it is. You're negotiating with the Iranian regime and the President's New Year's greeting to the Iranian people called for them to speak out in support of a nuclear deal. Mr. President, 
don't you understand that in Iran you can't speak out? That if you do speak out and petition your government, you can get shot or put in jail? You don't understand that? You're talking to people as if they have a voice. You're talking about the regime as if they're some kind of rational actor. And in that same year's greeting, he complimented the regime, headed up by the Ayatollahs, as being uh, cooperative in terms of their nuclear negotiations with the P5 plus one. What the president did mention is that this very regime is spreading terror unlike any time in recent memory. They're involved in the toppling of four Arab capitals. They're wreaking havoc on the neighborhood. As we negotiate on their nuclear deal, they're still the largest state sponsor of terrorism. They called for death to America two days ago. So did the Obama administration. Wake up and change your policies before you set the whole world on fire. Please watch your language, because our best ally in the region, the state of Israel, does not deserve the label of occupier, given the facts on the ground. And they do not deserve to hear from the chief of staff of the President of the United States language that's usually reserved for a terrorist organization. So when I thought it couldn't get any worse, it has. And let me put the Obama administration on notice. You may not like the fact that President, uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu won, but he did. And here's what you need to understand. If you're recalculating the administration's support for Israel in terms of how you handle resolutions in the United Nations, you need to understand that Congress will recalculate how we relate to the United Nations if you stand on the sidelines and let the UN take over the peace process. There will be a bipartisan, violent backlash in this body if the Obama administration does not veto a UN resolution defining the peace process in the Security Council, avoiding direct negotiations between the parties. I'm here to tell you one of the casualties of a haphazard foreign policy could be the relationship between the United Nations and the Congress. I promise you, there is bipartisan support in this body for two things. To stand firmly with Israel and not to allow the UN Security Council to take over the peace process and define the terms of a deal. And secondly, if there's a deal with the Iranians over their nuclear program, if this administration takes that deal to the UN Security Council, bypassing Congress, not coming to us first, there'll be a great backlash regarding that move. So to the Obama administration, Israel's not the problem. The Israeli people have not killed one American soldier. The Israeli people are in a dispute about their survival with the Palestinian people. The Israeli people gave land to the Palestinians in return. They got 10,000 rockets, and you want them to do it again. Can't you understand why Israel may not want to withdraw from West Bank, given the history of Gaza? If you can't, you're completely blind to the world as it is, and your hatred and your disgust and disdain for the Prime Minister has clouded your judgment. So to our friends in Israel, there can only be one Commander-in-Chief, and that's the way it should be. But there are 535 of us in the House and the Senate and we do have your back. We will not sit on the sidelines and watch this rhetoric enacted into a, in a manner that would put you at risk beyond what you already have in terms of risk. This is a low point for me, that an administration, an American president, administration, the chief of staff of an American president would use this language but it fits into an overall pattern that I think is very destructive. And to President Obama and Mr. McDonough, your foreign policy is not working. If you don't get that, then God help us all. Because what you're doing in the Mideast is not working. You're making everything worse. And now you've added fuel to the fire. I hope that there will be self, some self-correction at the White House, that we will not take this rhetoric any further than we have today.
that there will be a reevaluation of whether or not it's appropriate to call the Israeli people occupiers, given the facts on the ground? Only time will tell. But I do understand this without any hesitation. There are many of us in this body who will not put up with this. We will push back. Israel has not killed one soldier, U.S. soldier. Israel hasn't toppled any of their neighbors. Israel doesn't chant death to America. You may not like the outcome of the Israeli election, but it was up to the Israeli people to decide, and they have decided. And all of us got into this body the same way. People at home voted for us. Under our Constitution, we have an equal voice to that of the President in terms of checks and balances. Even though he is the leader of American foreign policy and the Commander-in-Chief, we do have a right to, to speak on such matters. So here is my voice, and I think I speak for many on both sides of the aisle. To the Israeli people, do what you have to do to defend the Jewish state. To the President of the United States and Mr. Madonna, Mr. McDonough, the language you use today is very unhelpful and quite frankly disconnected from reality. And I would end with this. Would any member of this body, if they were in Israeli leadership, withdraw from the West Bank, given what's going on in the region? Would any member of this body be as restrained in responding to a rocket attack coming from a neighbor as Israel's been restrained? What would we do if some terrorist organization next door to us launched a rocket trying to kill our children, would we be as restrained as our, as our Israeli friends? I doubt it. So I'm asking this body to walk a mile in the shoes of the Israeli people and understand why this statement is so offensive and has usually been reserved for terrorist organizations, not the leader of the free world. I'll yield back.